Our bodies have an evolutionary story. As the descendants of flat-footed apes, we are not the quickest, but over millions of years we have developed a series of adaptations that make us excellent long-distance runners. The first step on this journey was bipedalism. But what caused us to branch away from our distant arboreal cousins to stand upright and walk on two legs? It all started with a change in diet. Around 10 million years ago, the Earth's climate cooled considerably. In the Great Rift Valley in East Africa, this cooling caused rainforests to shrink and woodland habitats to expand. For the inhabitants of those rainforests, the great apes, this shift meant that the ripe fruits that were the mainstay of their diets would have become less abundant, more dispersed and more seasonal. They would have had to travel farther to get the same amount of food and to resort to more frequently eating what are known as fallback foods. The fossil records and genetic evidence shows how different species of great ape began going their separate ways in response to this change. First, the gorilla separated off, then chimpanzees, and around this time we begin to see creatures walking on two legs. While swapping from four legs to two made them slower and less stable, over many generations these apes became gradually better at walking upright until eventually they were a new species. We are their descendants. Among other theories, bipedalism is thought to have evolved as an adaptation for carrying food, foraging upright, making and using tools, keeping cool, seeing over tall grasses, swimming and showing off genitalia. But perhaps most importantly, bipedalism was a way to save calories. You see, it all comes down to energy availability. Chimpanzees could rely on fallback foods like fibrous stems and the leaves of plants, as well as various herbs. But the evidence suggests that the first hominins particularly those at the margins of what was left of the forest, would have needed to find and eat these kinds of foods more often and more intensely than chimps do. They just wouldn't have provided them with enough energy to survive. The issue with having to walk long distances to get food is that it costs energy, particularly when you're an ape. So to fulfill a need to walk longer distances, Natural selection triggered changes in our anatomy so that we could walk further, more efficiently. If you watch a chimpanzee walk upright, you can see that it keeps its legs far apart and its upper body sways from side to side. In contrast, we Homo sapiens sway our torsos almost imperceptibly, which means our energy expenditure is mostly directed to moving forward instead of stabilizing the upper body. Our steadier gait is largely attributable to a simple change in the shape of our pelvis. As the figure shows, the large broad bone that forms the upper part of the pelvis, the ilium, is tall and faces backwards in apes, but this part of the hip is short and faces sideways in humans. This sideways orientation is a crucial adaptation for bipedalism because it allows the muscles on the side of the hips the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus muscles, to stabilise the upper body over each leg during walking, when only one leg is on the ground. Chimps can't stand or walk this way because their hips face backwards. This means that those gluteal muscles are not ideally placed to stabilise the trunk and upper limbs while also propelling the body forward. So, the chimp must spend energy and adapt within their own anatomical constraints. The only way a chip can avoid falling sideways when one leg is on the ground is by tilting its trunk to the side above that leg. This sets off a chain reaction of muscle contractions to keep everything taut and stable, and these contractions cost energy. Another important adaptation for being a biped is an S-shaped spine. Like other quadrupeds, apes have spines that curve gently, so when they stand upright, their trunks naturally tilt forward. Their torso is positioned in front of its hips. This means they have to contract lots of muscles in their posterior chain, their extrinsic and intrinsic back musculature and their gluteal muscles to stop from falling forward. 
In contrast, our spine has two pairs of curves, which centre around a thoracic kyphosis and a lumbar lordosis. This brings our centre of mass back over our bipedal base of support, so we can stand with much less effort. That's not all either. We have expanded heel bones that increase the leverage of the muscles and tendons around our legs and feet, arches in our feet to store energy, a big toe that points forward allowing us to push off, stabilised ankles, long legs for efficiency, buttressed knees to absorb force, inwardly angled thighs, expanded hip joints and a downwardly oriented foramen magnum, the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord exits the cranial cavity, so there are no kinks in the spinal cord when we are standing upright. The consequence of all these adaptations is a more efficient gait. Experiments conducted in the early 70s that involved getting chimpanzees to walk on a treadmill while wearing oxygen masks showed that walking was almost three times more costly in chimpanzees than in humans and other mammals of the same size. A generation later, these results were confirmed in adult chimps using more modern methods. Controlling for different body sizes, average humans spend the same amount of energy to walk a given distance as dogs and most other quadrupeds, but chimpanzees and other primates spend slightly more than twice as much calories. In the real world, chimps walk comparatively little, only about two or three kilometers a day, about one or two miles. For the same amount of energy, a human can walk between eight and 12 kilometers or five to 7.5 miles. That's a massive saving for a species needing to travel to find food to fulfill daily energy demands because life is fundamentally about acquiring and using scarce energy to make more life. Those apes who are better able to conserve energy would have had a reproductive advantage. This advantage shows in the fossil record. Until relatively recently, the world was teeming with different species of Homo who were all adept at walking. Neanderthals, Denisovans, Homo florensis, or hobbits, Homo luzonensis, and Homo naledi are just some of the species of Homo that were walking the earth. Early homonyms were walking about 6 million years ago, but they needed an additional 4 million years to acquire the capabilities for endurance running. The sequence for the genus Homo looks something like this. We were adept climbers first, and then became walkers who could climb pretty well. Then gradually, we lost our ability to climb, at least as well as our ape cousins, but became walkers who could run when needed. About two million years ago, after another change in climate turned much of Africa into open woodlands and grassy savanna, our vegetarian ancestors had to again adjust their diets and start scavenging and hunting game. They became omnivores. Hominins probably started to eat meat by scavenging. But by two million years ago, there is clear archaeological evidence that they also tracked and hunted large animals like wildebeests and kudu. In fact, tracking may have developed nearly 1.5 million years ago. Footprints from Kenya show how early hominins were tracking the muddy margins of a lake where both trails and their makers could be watched and ambushed. But following prey is one thing, actually killing it is another. And the act of putting stone points on spears was only invented around 500,000 years ago, and the bow and arrow was invented less than 100,000 years ago. So how did these homonyms overcome such large game as wildebeest? Simple, they used their endurance. Pursuit, persistence, or endurance hunting is strongly connected to tracking and involves chasing prey to exhaustion, after which killing is simple and you don't need advanced weaponry to do it. There are several ways to persistence hunt. One is to take advantage of the distinctive human ability to not overheat while running. At the hottest time of the day, a group of hunters will chase an animal. The bigger the better, because larger animals, like larger humans, overheat and tire faster. At first, the prey will inevitably gallop away faster than the hunters, who typically jog at a relaxed pace. Then, while the animal pants to cool down, the hunters relentlessly track it, often while walking, so they can chase their prey again before it is cooled. 
This process of chasing, tracking, chasing and tracking is repeated, and assuming the hunters resume the chase before the animal fully cools, its body temperature will gradually keep rising until eventually it reaches a state of heat stroke and collapses. A hunter can then walk right up to the animal and dispatch it safely without sophisticated weapons. According to records from hunts carried out by present-day hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari, the average distance travelled during these endurance hunts is slightly longer than a half marathon, or about 21.1 kilometres, and the hunters walk about half the time and ran at a 10 minute per mile pace, or about 6 minutes and 13 seconds per kilometre for the rest. Importantly, the most challenging aspect of these hunts is not the running, but the ability to track using clues such as footprints, traces of blood and knowledge of the animal's likely behaviour. An ability to run was obviously vital for us to be able to persist and hunt. And the ability to run, the serious, dogged, long-distance kind, is the thing that separates us from all those other species of homo I mentioned before. Taking the Neanderthals as an example, they were probably more efficient walkers than us due to their wider waists, their massively muscled thighs, their slightly curved leg bones, and reinforced foot arches. These adaptations were needed to cope with their greater bulk, but they also meant that sprinting, and especially endurance running, would have been more difficult for them. The most recent fossil and genetic evidence suggests that we, Homo sapiens, evolved from an anatomically diverse metapopulation connected across many regions of the African continent between 800 and 600,000 years ago. The oldest Homo sapiens skulls, pretty much like extant humans today, date to around 200 to 150,000 years ago in East Africa. So what anatomical adaptations have enabled us to be so good at endurance running? First, our legs are relatively long for an animal of our size, something that becomes obvious when standing next to a chimpanzee. That increases the length of our stride. Human legs also have lengthy elastic tendons like the Achilles. According to one estimate, the Achilles tendon and the spring in the arch of the human foot, known as the plantar fascia, together return about half the mechanical energy of the body hitting the ground. And that's before putting on carbon-plated running shoes. Longer tendons like the Achilles aren't necessary for walking, but they function as springs during running. Every time your legs and feet land on the ground during a run, these tendons stretch as your hips, knees and ankles flex and the arch in your foot flattens. When the tendons recoil, the energy they store is returned to help propel you back into the air. All animals adapted for running, from greyhounds to deer, have legs with long springy tendons, but these tendons are short in our close relatives like the chimpanzee. That means humans independently evolved long tendons like the Achilles to help us run. And because we are unsteady bipeds that evolved from tree climbing apes, it makes sense that humans evolved a suite of features for stabilization. For example, our large gluteus maximus, the largest muscle in the human body, is fairly inactive during walking, but during running, it activates forcefully with every step, preventing the trunk from falling forward. We can also rotate our trunks as we pump our arms in a kind of counter synchrony with our legs, which helps to conserve energy. And then we have the nuchal ligament at the base of the skull, which helps keep our heads steady as we run. When it comes to our cardiovascular system, at rest, the heart pumps about four to six litres of blood each minute. But during running, it can pump as much as five times more to supply hardworking muscles and cool the body. A typical runner's heart pumps 20 to 24 litres a minute, and an elite runner's can reach an impressive 35 litres a minute. We can do this because we have evolved voluminous and elastic heart chambers that differ markedly from the smaller, thicker, stiffer hearts of apes. We also have an increased blood supply to the brain to help cool this vital organ during exercise. Our leg muscles usually have 50 to 70% fatigue resistant slow twitch fibres, far more than chimpanzees, which range from 11 to 32%. Beyond our legs, glutes, rotating torso, stable heads, and industrious hearts, the most vital and unique adaptation that enables humans to run for long periods, though, is our ability to sweat. 
running generates a lot of body heat, and this can be dangerous in high heat and humidity. Like all mammals, we cool using evaporation. When heat turns water into steam, the energy lost chills the skin underneath. Most animals take advantage of this natural refrigeration by panting, taking short, shallow breaths to evaporate saliva in their throats and on their tongues. As water evaporates and cools the skin, blood in the veins just beneath is also cooled. This chilled blood then cools the rest of the body. But panting is constrained by two things. First, tongues, mouths and noses only provide a small surface area for cooling. And second, when dogs and other quadrupeds gallop, they lose the ability to pant because galloping is a seesaw type of gait that slams the guts into the diaphragm with every stride. When a quadrupedal animal shifts from a trot to a gallop, it must stop panting and synchronize each breath with each stride, so it can't effectively cool itself at slower speeds. In contrast, we humans have evolved an effective cooling system by taking advantage of special water-secreting eccrine glands. We alone have 5 to 10 million sweat glands all over our skin, especially in our heads, limbs and chests. Sweating effectively turns the entire body into a giant wet tongue. We also lost our fur, which helps air move along the skin's surface without any barrier, and this enables us to rapidly discharge large quantities of heat. Of all our unique traits, no animal sweats better than us. When running in the heat, humans can sweat one litre per hour, sometimes even more, enough to keep cool while racing a marathon in 32 degrees Celsius. No other animal can do that. Almost all the features I reviewed that help humans run are what biologists would term convergent, which means they evolved independently in humans and other animals adapted for running. They're not necessary for walking. You see, running is not just a faster form of locomotion than walking. It's mechanically very different. And those mechanics, or more specifically, those biomechanics, are what we'll discuss in the next part.